on Kesme 107.1 FM and across the world at 3news.com. Coming up in the next 30 minutes. Office of Special Prosecutor issues half-year report for 2024, assuring office will soon issue directives on Airbus, SE, Ghana Police Service and Gaming Commission cases. Also running mate of New Patriotic Party, Dr. Matthew Pokupempe apologizes days after making comments which is widely seen as denigrating the legacy of Ghana's first president, Dr. Matthew Pokupempe, will also be going to his constituency where almost 600 uh, candidate uh, delegates are expected to select a new parliamentary candidate for that constituency. Much later, organized Labour holding emergency meeting to determine its next line of action after National Pensions Regulatory Commission, NPRA, gave its approval for the sale of Smith shares in some four hotels. Thank you very much for joining us. Now, the Office of the Special Prosecutor has issued its half-year report for the 2024 uh, issued on July 11, 2024. According to the report signed by the Special Prosecutor, Kisia Jabing, the OSP has successfully concluded three notable cases and will soon issue further directives on them. The office provided an update on cases under investigations. Uh, the first one was Cecilia Dapa, which is said OSP is monitoring channels of large sums of money. Ongoing cases, Republic versus Ajenim Boatin EJ, and another contract for sale issue, also Republic versus Sumaila Abdul Rahman and others. That is around the Northern Development Authority case. The, the Republic versus Alexander Kwabanasa for Kantanka, uh, which has to do with a vote by, uh, buying case. Concluded investigations, Airbus CSE. Special Prosecutor says it would issue further directives. Now, some ongoing cases, SML, Akunta Mining, Payroll Audit, Charles Bissu's case, Gaming Commission of Ghana's case. Now, the OSP has come under some intense criticism, including calls from some quarters for the special prosecutor to be removed from office. A petition was filed but was dismissed by the Chief Justice. Now, there is also a pending suit against the law establishing the OSP. But what has the special prosecutor himself been saying about what he considers recent attacks on himself and the office. It says, in the first half of 2024, the office was confronted with formidable existential challenges as corrupt actors and interests and their agents accentuated their pushback against the principal officers of the office and the very existence and essence of the office. The office conceptualizes the attacks on its principal officers and attempt to whittle away the mandate and powers of the office as a testament that the office is indeed performing its anti-corruption role and creditably and it is gradually disrupting corrupt interests. So that's what Kisia Jabin said even at the opening of that report. We're joined by co-chair Citizens Movement Against Corruption, Adam Senanu. Good afternoon to you, sir. Thank you for joining us. Good afternoon. Let me first get your comment on this preliminary statement from the OSP, even leading into this uh, half-year report. Well, delighted, as always, that we put in place a system. Uh, this is the only anti-graft institution where we insisted that every six months there should be a report to the people of Ghana on what they have done. Um, the law itself was built on the back of lessons learned in terms of the gaps as far as we could see relating to the other, other anti-corruption agencies. I think also in terms of describing the work done, uh, there are substantive issues they have taken on board. Uh, the only area where I think we need some important intervention at the moment critically is considering a fast-track anti-corruption court system uh, says that cases within that space can be dealt with expeditiously and the right precedent set. 
Let's talk about the Airbus uh, SE scandal. The OSP says it will soon issue directives. How could your wall closure be to that very case? I mean, going into December 7. I think extremely so. And I think that the sooner the better, especially when one of the uh, key actors is also somebody participating in, in this year's elections. It will definitely uh, assure that candidate of, of, of you know, the PC needs and uh, the support on one hand. On the other hand, it will provide citizens with understanding of whether uh, this candidate or people associated are persons we ought to be voting for or not. So I think that dealing with this uh, long before the end of the year, the December 7th date, will be extremely important. And now the OSP mentioning Cecilia Dapas uh, case in this half year report uh, seems to give the indication that I haven't completely given up on this case yet. It says it is monitoring channels of large sums of money after the back and forth with the Yoko that we spoke about. Uh, how important will this be really? Well, to the extent that they have reason to believe that those channels could be exploited again, uh, then absolutely. Um, I assume that their work with the FBI allowed them to track individuals who may have been the source of the monies that were funded and channeled into Ghana. Uh, they probably also know the routes, uh, how the people departed, how they entered the country, etc. And they may want to be closely monitoring such persons and such routes just to make sure that they are not further exploited uh, to bring such monies into the country. I want to take you back to the Airbus SE, and you said that it is very important, and the earlier this was done, the better. Uh, how do you think that would inform how uh, debates are, are, are established or had around the presidential candidates going into this year's election, and whether or not you think it would influence votes at all? Well, yes. I mean, um, you would have one side of the debate continuously making reference to this case uh, because people have been fingered. Um, uh, they can inure some benefit from continuously speculating that the said person was actively involved in corrupt practices. On the other hand, the other party would want to clear their name and to, and to establish that, no, uh, this was a case. After investigation, I have been cleared or not cleared Hopefully, uh, obviously not in this case um, from the presidency. So I think that these issues must be dealt with substantively uh, so that those of us also going to the poll are clear if we are choosing candidate A, B or C that we are choosing from a very informed perspective. Mr. Sinan, I want to get your thoughts on the ongoing investigations, uh, yes, according to the OSP, uh, which include SMLDU, Akonta Mining, Payroll Audits, Charles Bisu's case, which also has to do around uh, with the uh, illegal mining area, Gaming Commission of Ghana, uh, th these cases. And I'm highlighting the illegal mining areas, which include the Akonta Mining case and the Charles Bisu's case, because we've heard reports that we're just about five months to the polls. They've relaxed on these anti galamse efforts. I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on uh, these, you know, cases that the OSP uh, is highlighting in his half-year report. Honestly, I wish that there could even have been an internal report on that sector because the multiplied effect, the, the, the spin-offs are so dangerous as far as our livelihoods and impact not just uh, in terms of the communities there but in terms of what is happening uh, relating to the nation at large that I don't think that this is something that we should take our eyes off the ball at any point um, and I don't know who else is paying keen attention to what is going on in that space so any report that tells us what is going on who are the key actors uh, if there are criminal activities that we can use uh, as a basis to get this to stop, it probably is one of the routes we should be strategizing to embrace and to take up seriously. We'll end it here. Thank you very much, Adam Senanu. He's co-chair Citizens Movement.
against corruption. Thank you so much for sharing those views with us. Now, Organised Labour is holding an emergency meeting to determine its next line of action after the National Pensions Regulatory Commission, NPRA, gave its approval for the sale of SNIT shares in some four hotels. The NPRA on June 28 directed SNIT to suspend its negotiations with Rock City over the sale of four hotels pending further evaluation and engagement. But answering questions on the floor of Parliament on Thursday, July 11, that's just yesterday, the Employment and Labour Relations Minister, who is also Pensions Minister, Ignatius Bafuewa, told the MPs that all due processes have been complied with. We'll shortly engage our Labour First correspondent, Daniel Poko, who is following up on this emergency meeting for us. But first, listen to uh, Bafo Ewa when he briefed the MPs yesterday. Mr. Speaker, Smith's decision to divest 60% of his state, stake in the hotels is not an isolated decision, but part of his broader strategy to improve investment performance and ensure the long-term sustainability of the scheme. NPRA came up with a directive. It needed to be furnished with all my information relating to the sale of the uh, hotels, which SNES has since done that. So, so it wasn't like a direct decision that SNES should not go ahead to do anything, but then uh, SNITs can only go ahead when NPRE, which is the regulator within the field, had actually certified that they had seen all the documentation and the processes and they think that they are good to go. You heard the Labour Unemployment Minister... Uh Employment and Labour Relations Minister, who is also the Pensions Minister, Ignatius Bafwe, uh, we have Daniel Opoko on the line with us. Daniel, what have you picked from this uh, meeting so far? Right, so good afternoon to you, Beatrice. Um, basically, organised labour is in a meeting um, to discuss the, the sale agreement based on what the Minister of Employment and Labour Relations said on the floor of Parliament yesterday. And they have asked the media to stay out of the meeting. They are having their own internal meetings before the official will speak to us. But um, I, I, I picked some information that the, the Labour has been discussing why the sector minister will proceed and announce that he, he received an authority, an express authority from, from the NPRA for the sale agreement to carry through. Earlier, someone on 28, which you rightly pointed out, that um, the, the SNES should suspend the sale agreement. But unfortunately, after the close of the the minister is saying that the agreement is likely to go through because he says that SNES has concluded discussions with NPR. But Labour is suspecting that there will have been another letter from NPR indicating the sale agreement. So there was a first letter asking SNES to suspend. Labour is suspecting a second letter which has not come yet. So they are questioning on what basis would the minister say that there has been a conclusion on the sale agreement with Carrot. These are the discussions before them, and, and, and they are very much incensed when you look at the atmosphere. They are just not too happy for what the sector minister said and also for the sale agreement. To the Daniel, I know we've been following this for some time now, and yesterday we spoke with Ibrahim Kumsin with the Ghana Federation of Labour. He, he said they had no idea about this. What do you anticipate could be the reaction or the response of organised labour to this latest announcement from the employment minister? Right, so, so yesterday to this morning, the decisions are picked where that organized labor were also, members of organized labor were also surprised because on the NPRA board, we have about four organized labor reps on the board. And on the SNIT board, we also have about four labor reps on the SNIT board. So they are the view that if indeed the sale agreement would want to be carried through, they believe there should have been a proper discussions and consultations on information from their reps on the board. But unfortunately, there was no information from their reps on the board, neither was there any adequate information from, from their reps on the Senate. So for the sale agreement to be carried through, we are very much surprised. Is the reason they have decided to convene this emergency meeting and tell government. So they, uh, I will also not be surprised that if Labour should decide to either hit the streets or ask their members not to or announce a nationwide industrial unrest. That will not be too good because when we look at them, they are very much upset with how the whole process has been conducted.
Thank you very much, Labour First Correspondent Daniel Lopoku, bringing us an uh, update from that emergency meeting of organised labour, and we'll bring you more as and when we have it. Now, days after making comments which was widely seen as denigrating the legacy of Ghana's first president, Dr Kwame Nkoma, the running mate of the New Patriotic Party, Dr Matthew Poku Prempe, has apologised for his comment. Let me read to you a brief statement uh, Dr Poku Prempe released. Uh, he said, did not mean to uh, denigrate former president Dr Kwame Nkoma on a or any other president, and he said, my statement last Tuesday, 9th July, in Kumase on the performance of President Akufuado has elicited, elicited various uh, varied reactions. The statement reflects my personal opinion about President Akufuado's impact relative to other presidents we have had. I wish to emphasize that I never meant to disrespect our former first president, Dr. Kwame Nkoma, or any of our former heads of state, including my own grand uncle and mentor, Mr. John Ejekum Kofu. I note the concerns raised after my statement. I apologize sincerely and regret any discomfort caused. Thank you, Dr. Matthew Pukuprempe, running mate to the MPP presidential candidate. We stay with the MPP because approximately 570 delegates are expected to decide on who replaces Dr. Matthew Pokoprempe as the governing New Patriotic Party's parliamentary candidate for the Mencia South constituency. Campaign has intensified with barely 72 hours to the polls. William Evans' income is leading events for us. He joins us live on the line. Evans, I can imagine the atmosphere there, but just give us updates on the candidates contesting this election on Sunday. Well, so each one of them is meeting delegates, over 570 delegates, um, just to be sure that the message has gone down well and that on Sunday at the St. Louis Junior High School Park is assured of victory. So it, it, the breakdown is as follows. 537 polling station executives from 107 polling stations, six electoral area coordinators, five council of elders and five patrons, of course, 17 constituency executives. So they make up the delegates, and I can tell you that each one of them has been very busy uh, since yesterday, even to the extent that they are not even ready to engage, I mean, the media. One thing that has even intensified the level of uh, seriousness attached to this particular uh, primary has to do with the recent uh, uh, study that the Professor uh, Smastapon uh, um, came through with. Now, we know that the contest is actually, uh, it's like it's between two uh, uh, candidates. We are talking about brother to uh, uh, Dr. Matthew Poku Prempe, that is uh, a three-year, also a three-year Prempe. And then, of course, we're also talking about Napus lawyer, uh, Nana Ejei Bewa. Now, if you engage the delegates, what some of them are saying is that they think that it has been a one-horse race since 1996, so they want to change the narrative. That is to say that that particular thing has rested in the heart of the Apeja royal family for far too long. So they want to change the narrative. But they will not come out openly and say that they will do that, I mean, when they enter the booth to cast their vote. The others were also saying that if that is the case, the lawyer of Dr. Matthew Poku Prempe, his grandfather is also ill from the Apeja house. So it is neither here nor there. So it is making this whole, I mean, primary quite interesting. Quite interesting. Beyond the utterances, though, you say campaign has intensified. How so? Are they doing door-to-door, -door, organizing mini rallies? How are the campaigns shaping up? Well, so they are doing cluster kind of um, campaign. Uh, Sometimes, and, and, and it depends on the uh, candidate. So, for instance, Jim BB, whom I followed briefly yesterday, um, he was doing the cluster type where you combine about two or three polling station executives or dele a delegate from, the, from two or three polling stations and then meet them. Uh, if you go to the camp of uh, lawyer uh, Bewa, he's also doing similar thing. For Nana Ousu Efriye Prempe, he is doing, I mean, one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, Sometimes you also meet them as a group and what have you. So uh, uh, they've adopted different strategies as far as meeting the delegates are concerned.
Thank you very much, William Evans Zinkelman. You want to stay with us because we bring you everything you need to know from this uh, parliamentary primary happening in Mensha South in the Ashanti region. In Waliwale, still on the party and supporters of the MPP in Janga in the northeast region have warned that they will work against the party in 2024 general election. Should it go, uh, should it impose the incumbent member of parliament, Hajia Lariba Zewara, on them? The supporters of the MPP stronghold addressing a press conference said that the party was already feeling the negative impact of the protracted electoral dispute warning that any further disregard of the people's confidence in the candidature of Dr. Karibu will be disastrous for the party. We risk facing unforeseen outcome. I repeat, if we fail to ensure fairness to Dr. K.B. Mahama, we risk facing unforeseen outcome at the polls. Yes. Yes. Let's embrace the wisdom of unity and reconcile our differences lest we suffer the bitter taste of defeats the ridicule of our opponents and the disillusionment of our royal supporters you heard a representative of MPP supporters in Wale Wale. Upper East Regional Correspondent Castro Senyala joins us live on the line with some more. Castro, what else can you tell us from this program? Well, Beatrice, uh, the press conference has just ended, and essentially what is like saying is that they would uh, not sit down and watch the, new, uh, the, 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 the leadership of the new patriotic party to impose uh, somebody on them. And that somebody we're talking about is uh, the incumbent MP, uh, Hagia. Larbazuera. According to them, uh, Zuera doesn't bring anything as far as uh, winning elections is concerned as compared to Dr. Kabir, who they say is shining almost in every corner of the constituency and is the only person who can win the seat for the party if there is someone to lead the party. They say that the continuous call for the leadership of the party to uh, resolve the issues have fallen on deaf ears. But then what they are planning to do is that if the party doesn't listen to them this one more time, they will be forced to work against the party in the upcoming general elections. And that would mean they would lose the, the seat to the opposition national Democratic Congress. They are, however, saying that if uh, the party listens to them and allows, um, I mean, and, and tells uh, the incumbent MP to draw the case, I mean, to draw the case from the court, and then uh, it is settled amicably, and then their preferred candidate, which is Dr. Kabiru, um, uh, is allowed to contest. They are assuring the party that they are going to win overwhelmingly as far as the Janga and the Walwale is concerned. Mm -hmm. Kasha, just very briefly, are you able to tell us how they intend to punish the party? Is it just declining to vote for the MPP? What, how exactly? Yes, so they've been speaking to me on that. They say they would withdraw from uh, supporting the party in every campaign activity or on all campaign activities. They would simply sit and watch. But then they wouldn't allow their brother, uh, the vice president, who they've described as their brother, to feel the heat of it because they know uh, he's their brother and he's on a different I mean, mission altogether. For him, they will campaign vigorously for the vice president to become president because they know if he wins, it's going to bring uh, them good. But then on the side of the parliamentary election, they will fold their arms, sit aloof and watch as the NDC snatches the seat. Thank you very much. Uh, Castro Senyala, he is a man in the Upper East region. We stay a bit long on politics because the leader of the new force, Nana Kwame Bidiako, has announced his intention to run as an independent candidate in the upcoming elections, citing delays in the party's registration process with the Electoral Commission as the primary reason for his decision. The of Ghana remains unwavering. Our fight relentless for our shared vision of a prosperous, united, and empowered nation, regardless of the challenges. This move is not about me. It's about ensuring that the voices of Ghanaians are heard and represented in our government. We will not be silent. We will not be stopped. This is my small speech to let you know and to ensure that I took this decision you heard leader of the new force, Nana Kwame Bediak. Apologies for the quality of the sound. Emmanuel Samani is attending this program with the leader of, uh, move, uh, of the new force. He joins us live now. Emmanuel, what else can you tell us from what Nana Kwame Bediak said? Right. Uh, many thanks, Beatrice. So 
he says that the decision to run as an independent candidate is actually driven by quite a number of challenges that they faced during the party registration process with the EC, despite uh, submitting all the required forms and meeting the criteria aligned by the EC, they say that they have uh, experienced extensive delays in receiving a formal response. Now, because you know that according to the EC, it will take about some seven days uh, to clarify on the application status when uh, an individual submits the forms. But in this case of the new force, uh, it took the EC about seven months to revert to the new force, letting them know about the uh, uh, provisional certificates. And so yeah, he says that looking at the way all the hazards have delayed is actually hindered on their, you know, their ability to mobilize support and plan their campaigns effectively. And so looking at all this after eight months, they decided to stick with going as an independent candidate leading up to the election because waiting an additional three months for the EC's vetting and licensing process would literally hamper on their campaign activities. And so this is the reason why, uh, you know, the new force in this case, the Nakama Bidekon has decided to go as an independent candidate and not as a political party. In addition, they've also been talking about challenges regarding uh, the 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 the, the um, voter registration exercise. He's talking about the fact that uh, you know, once the voter registration exercise is open, it's only open for about 20 or so days, and so it disenfranchises a lot of individuals, particularly the youth who just turned 18. And so he's calling on the EC mm. to you know have a a, a year long vote or a continuous voter registration exercise to enable a lot more individuals, uh, you know, take part in the voting. And so uh, this is what, uh, you know, leader of the new force, and Nakomi Dekong, has been saying here at uh, his Kuala's residence. Thank you very much, Emmanuel Somani, uh, for bringing us that report. The 2024 Basic Education Certificate Examination comes to an end today for most candidates with those writing Arabic ending their exams on Monday, July 15. Already, at least seven teachers and invigilators have been arrested for condoning examination more practices in the ongoing BEC in the Ashanti region alone. The Ministry of Education says the apprehended individuals would be made to face prosecution to discourage others from engaging in such acts. Over 569,000 candidates were registered to partake in this year's BEC and we're joined by John uh, Kapi. He is Head of Public Affairs at the West Africa Examination Council at Wayek. Good afternoon to you, sir. Thank you for joining us. Good afternoon. Thanks for having me. Let me first ask of your assessment of this year's BEC. Um, I would say that uh, our standards, uh, we've been able to organize a successful examination. Uh, I would say our standards because uh, we've been able to print the, the questions, we've been able to distribute them without any uh, incidents. Also, we've been able to take care of a few uh, candidates who have, uh, you know, special educational needs, those with low vision, those with cerebral palsy, and some people who have lost their vision but are not able to read Braille, we've been able to make provision for them all. And so far, we haven't received any uh, complaints from any quarters that any of these have been left out. We also have been able to reach out to those who were cut off by floods that is the sexual Afram place area there. So on our part, we would think that we've done a successful job. I know that prior to the BEC, uh, you know, there was, there was this issue about you not having money and the, the possibility of not being able to organize the exams as you wanted. You've been able to do it. Today is last, uh, the last day for this exercise. Are you owing people or the monies that you needed have been giving you? So um, I think we indicated in our press uh, briefing last Friday that we had received about 60 or 62 percent thereabouts of the amount that we needed. And so we've been able to conduct the examination. But as we were speaking last Friday, um, plans were being made to release the rest of the, uh, the money to us. Um, I've not been in touch with the uh, director of finance because I'm monitoring the examination. So I'll find out from him whether indeed the monies have been released or how far they've gone with the process of getting the money. 
for us to do the match in a release of results. Nonetheless, there were reported cases of more practices nationwide. How many cases came to the attention of WAEC? So for now, uh, per our records, uh, from what I've received so far, and that is not the end of the list, we've been able to pick up 19 examination officials across the country. Uh, we've picked up three passes by, I call them passes by because they had no uh, relation to the examination. They were just trying to uh, provide some material to the examinations, uh, to the examination candidates, right? And then we, we've also been able to pick up 12 teachers from, uh, you know, a cross-section of schools that were either found in their school bus trying to, uh, you know, answer questions and send same to uh, the candidates or by the side they had uh, answers ready to reach out to the candidates. So these are the categories of people we've picked up so far. But the reports I have, we still have our monitors in the field who will be uh, providing us reports of other incidents in uh, those other centers where they are. Wendy here. Thank you so much. And that was John Kapi. He's the head of public affairs at the West African Examinations Council. And that's how we end the news here on Sri FM. My name is Beatrice Edu. Thank you very much for joining us today. Coming up shortly is Business Daily with Bismarck. I will uh, log on to srinews.com for more news. Good afternoon. Gets busy on this frequency. 92.7 3FM. Good afternoon. This is Business Daily. Coming up, Cybersecurity Authority warns of prosecution of unlicensed cybersecurity service providers. We'll hear from Director General Dr. Albert Ndjibwesiako. If you're not very careful, we'll go and sleep and wake up. They say, see, they're coming to regulate contractors. They are coming to regulate developers or what have you. We need to get certain clarities. Plus, Ghana Chamber of Construction Industry demands clarity on legislative instruments seeking to regulate cement prices. We'll hear from the CEO, Emmanuel Cherry. My name is Bismarck Aousa. Now to our very first story, Director General of the Cyber Security Authority, Dr. Entry, Albert Entry Buisiaku has issued a stern warning to cyber security service providers operating without proper licensing or accreditation, emphasizing that such actions violate the Cyber Security Act 2020, Act 1038. He highlighted that his outfit will take stringent measures, including criminal prosecutions and administrative penalties to ensure compliance. Dr. Albert and Tribuesiaku also encouraged operators in the licensing process to meet all requirements and mentioned on, ongoing efforts with the Public Procurement Authority, PPA, to enforce an adherence to the Act. I hereby take this opportunity also to caution uh, the other service providers, establishment and professionals who are offering the service uh, without a license. As a matter of fact, as I said, we believe and discipline. We believe in compliance. I think we've allowed a certain time to engage, to support, to debate, but we are moving into a phase where we're going to take action. And those actions are provided within the law with a number of avenues available to us. We may begin publishing institutions two ways who are in good standing to offer cyber street in the country. We will equally published institutions who have, who are offering cyber security services without what? A license. 
we will. And those rock records will be there. Nobody will challenge the authority to remove them. They will be. You cannot. The law makes it clearly that you cannot offer cyber security services without a license or accreditation. So I think this is a warning to those who have not complied. We will publish them. And that was Director General of the Cybersecurity Authority, Dr. Albert Entrebesiako. Meanwhile, after months of rigorous efforts to align Ghana's cybersecurity standards with global benchmarks, the Cybersecurity Authority has officially licensed and accredited qualified cybersecurity industry players. This makes Ghana the first country in Africa and the second globally following Singapore to implement a comprehensive regulatory framework for cybersecurity service providers, establishments, and professionals. In a total, in all, a total of 51 industry players received their licenses and accreditations from the authority. Moving on, the Ghana Chamber of Construction Industry is urging the Ministry of Trade and Industry to provide clarity on the legislative instrument laid before Parliament to regulate cement prices in the country. The Chamber argues that the instrument lacks clarity and is shrouded in secrecy with the potential to have far-reaching consequences beyond its intended scope. The Chief Executive of the Chamber, Emmanuel Cherry, addressed the media at a consultative, a consultative stakeholders forum on cement pricing and its implications for the growth of the construction sector and the economy in Accra. If you see the LI, the Section 2, Clause C, states that other entities, who are those entities? It's shrouded in the secrecy. If you're not very careful, we'll go and sleep and wake up, they say, say, they are coming to regulate contractors, they are coming to regulate developers, or what have you. We need to get certain clarities. Because in the build environment, it's not cement alone. That is our challenge. We have other materials that would have loved to find a space in this particular uh, draft airline. So that we approach it holistically, once and for all. Does that mean that the minister is trying to take the, the issues one after the other? Number two. As we speak today, before such things is being uh, achieved, you need to have an authority. What is the basis? What is the policy? The policy must come and define all these ramifications. But we don't. We seems not to have any policy document backing this. Meanwhile, the chamber also noted that stiff opposition to the legislative instrument could have been avoided if the minister Katie Hammond had engaged stakeholders within the value chain to reach a consensus. And listening to the producers, you realize that they themselves, they are more than ready to have the disclosure of the, build, the price build-up. But the approach, that's the methodology, as the, uh, the chairman said earlier, is where the uh, issues were. Because if there was a proper consultation as we started today, you see, almost all the key stakeholders who matters are here, except we intentionally, deliberately omitted Ministry of Trade and the Ghana Standard Authority because you want to take it one after the other. Listening to everybody, you realize that, in fact, we are all at a loss and we have an industry to protect. In as much as the government is trying to regulate the price or find a way to uh, regulate the price within the market, we must also not forget that what are the bottlenecks? What are the challenges? That is pinching these particular people as a result of this uh, price fluctuation. And that was Chief Executive of the Ghana Chamber of Construction Industry, Emmanuel Cherry. Now, the Federation of Associations of Ghana Exporters has urged the government to introduce a single-digit single interest rate free loan for the agricultural sector. The association believes that such a measure would boost the export of agricultural produce, thereby increasing the inflow of foreign exchange needed to stabilize the local currency. Davis Nakobu Na is president of the Federation of Ghanaian exporters. Talking about financing the, 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 the sector, you see, uh, we understand that the banks are operating on uh, taking of people's money, but we all equally think that the only way we can make sure that the, if, if we have a lot of investment and attract a lot of people into that sector is for government to create a special purpose vehicle where we are able to access funds at single digit interest rates. And also at the long term investment, because if you look at people are doing mangoes, others are doing, these are not just crops that will need just about an, uh, just a month 
uh, for them to be repaid back their money. These are long-term investments. That means a lot of special purpose uh, vehicle to be able to do that. Because if we have to go by the 35%, 23%, I think, won't be competitive. So these are the areas we are looking at. We are also looking at, uh, if currently, if you look at the in industry, uh, we, we keep talking about unemployment for the youth. And this is the only part that the youth can also take advantage because of it, there are a lot of things on the value chain where they can tap into. And that was President of the Federation of Associations of Ghanaian Exporters, Davis Na Cowboy, and then Business Daily with me, Bismarck. For more business stories, please log on to 3news.com. Thanks for your company.